Good, good afternoon, everyone, or wherever you are. Um, good day, good evening. Uh, my name is Prasenjit Dwara. I'm the director of uh, the Global Asia Initiative. And we are absolutely delighted to have the first uh, in-person talk, uh, though with the bulk of the audience uh, online, uh, and by uh, Dr. Yuan Chen, who is uh, the postdoctoral associate at uh, both the Franklin Humanities Institute and the Global Asia Initiative. You clearly know her topic on uh, Kaifeng, uh, which is why you've signed on. Uh, and uh, just to remind you a little bit about uh, uh, Dr. Yuan Chen's uh, biography, she received her PhD from uh, the history department at Yale University, and she has also taught as a visiting professor at Boston College. Uh, teaching classes on early China and food history. Uh, but basically, her research is on the history of the environment in pre-modern China. Um, and uh, she is working uh, while here at uh, her developing her uh, very brilliant PhD thesis on Kaifeng, um, the Sung capital. Uh, and the topic is Kaifeng, what it took to feed, furnish, and fortify the world's largest city, uh, to say the northern Sung capital, uh, 900 to 1200, and explores the environmental changes uh, of the middle period of China uh, from the perspective of Kaifeng, right? And so she will be talking more about this uh, topic and how she's developing it and so on. So over to you, uh, Yuan. Uh, so thank you for this very generous introduction. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk here. Um, so as um, Professor Duaro just introduced, I am an environmental historian. Uh, but, you know, before when I attended um, various environmental humanities events or conferences or workshops, I usually find myself alone. Uh, what I mean is, you know, I was either the only East Asianist or the only pre-modernist in those events, and or sometimes, you know, both. So that makes me really aware of this general lack of attention to non-Western regions and uh, to the pre-modern period. Um, most people believe that our current environmental problems had a recent origin in the 18th century or 19th century in Europe during the Industrial Revolution. And um, uh, of course, there are many good reasons to, you know, to believe so. Uh, this graph on the right, for example, is usually cited as a smoking gun evidence for human-induced climate change. This graph shows the change of the concentration of CO2, or the greenhouse gas, in the atmosphere since the beginning of the Common Era. The data set is a collaborative effort by two groups of scientists. Um, so one of, them, one of them are the paleoclimatologists, who have gathered historical data from ice cores the top left of photo shows one of the ice core samples retrieved from Greenland. And also the atmospheric scientists who have been measuring daily data uh, in the observatory as shown at the bottom. Uh, and that observatory is in Mauna Loa on the big island in Hawaii since 1958. And I believe most people when looking at this graph probably have three main observations. Uh, first of all, the carbon level had been increasing steadily since around 200 years ago. And the second, since around uh, 100 years ago, the level exceeded the previous historic high. And the third, it is going up at a pace much faster than before. So these observations are definitely alarming 
because we can see a clear correlation between the spike and the Industrial Revolution at the turn of the 19th century. And that points to the unprecedented human footprint on the environment in the modern era. We definitely hope that with some proper management of our industries and uh, of our way of life, the carbon level will plateau and eventually drop. But this is our hope. We don't really know what is ahead of us because we are literally in uncharted waters. It seems to be a one-way street. There is probably no coming back because never before has history witnessed such high carbon concentration. We don't know, and actually nobody really knows, if the level can really come down from such a high level one day. Um, but my question is, do we really have no precedence? So, if we just lack the modern or early, that's the same graph, if we just look at the modern or early modern history, as people usually do, we easily lose sight of the long process that has led us to where we are today. So what if we look back uh, further to before the Industrial Revolution? Um, as we can see, the pre-industrial part of the curve, uh, which I shaded in light green on the slide, it seems quite flat and uneventful. Um, however, let me enlarge this section for you, and you will probably have some very different impressions. So let us have a thought experiment. Uh, let us imagine there is this 19th century scholar who happened to acquire some future technology uh, that enabled him to produce this graph to his day. Uh, so it's very important in this thought experiment to assume that uh, our imaginary scholar could only be able to see it to his day, uh, as we are not really giving him any futuristic vision to predict uh, what's going to happen later. Uh, we only gave him the necessary technology to measure and quantify carbon concentration in the air up to his day. So with that in mind, what this hypothetical 19th century scholar would see is this graph. Uh, the part that I highlighted in blue, so not very easy to see, uh, at the end of the curve is the period of the Industrial Revolution, roughly from the 1760s to 1840s. And looking at this graph, uh, our hypothetical scholar would notice that the level of CO2 reached its maximum uh, back in the 12th century, and then experienced a second high in the 16th century. But following both peaks, the level dropped for reasons that he still had to figure out. Um, even if he observed at the end of the Industrial Revolution in the 1840s, um, our imaginary scholar uh, would see that the carbon level had not yet reached its historical high or even the second high. Uh, therefore, although the pace and the trend of the increase seemed concerning, if he judged only from the historical movement of the CO2 concentration, it would be hard to predict what would happen in the future. Okay, so let's resume the talk. We had some tech problem, uh, and I hope it's uh, resolved now. Uh, so let us, took, uh, let, let us look at this uh, graph, which I showed you in the previous slide. So, um, as I explained, is everything okay? Yeah. So, I, as I explained, this graph shows uh, the carbon concentration in the atmosphere up to our day. Um, so, if we look at the green part, you know, the lower part that I shaded green, so that is the pre-industrial part. Uh, of this curve. So from this view, it definitely seems flat and uh, uneventful. However, if I enlarge this section, and you will probably have some very different impressions. Um, so I was talking about some thought experiment. And imagine there is this 19th century scholar, an imaginary scholar, and who happened to acquire some future technology that enabled him to produce and uh, visualize this graph up to his day. 
uh, it is really important for me to assume that you know he could only be able to see the uh, the graph up to his day as it uh, as you know I'm not really giving him any hypothetical superpower to predict the future. Um, we only gave him the necessary technology to measure and quantify the carbon concentration in the air to his day. So with that in mind, this hypothetical 19th century scholar would see um, is this graph. And the part I highlighted in blue at the very end of the curve is the period of the Industrial Revolution, roughly from the 1760s to 1840s. And uh, looking at this graph, uh, this hypothetical scholar would notice that the level of CO2 reached its maximum back in the 12th century. And then a second high in the 16th century. And following both peaks, uh, the level dropped for reasons that he still had to figure out. So even if he observed at the very end of the Industrial Revolution in the 1840s, this imaginary scholar would see that the carbon level had not yet reached uh, its historical high or second high. So although the pace and the trend of the increase seemed concerning, if this scholar judged only from the historical movement of the CO2 concentration, it would be hard to really predict what would happen in the future. So maybe the level would continue to go up, which is the reality that we're experiencing today, or maybe it would come down at some point, just like what happened after the previous two high points in the 12th century um, and uh, the 16th century. So now let us repeat the same thought experiment. Uh, but let's move the timeline several centuries earlier to before the occurrence of the first high point in the 1100s. Uh, let's zoom into the area that I shaded in light blue. So now we are going to repeat the same thought experiment and imagine there is a 11th century scholar and I you know, have the same assumption here, that he has futuristic technology, but has no vision to see the future. So he also managed to measure and visualize the graph of CO2 concentration up to his day. And uh, this 11th century scholar would uh, see uh, this graph, and he may have three impressions. So first of all, the carbon level had been increasing steadily since about 150 years ago. And the second, uh, since about half a century ago, the level exceeded the previous historical high. And the third, it was still going up at a pace much faster than before. And I wonder if you find these statements familiar. So these are actually the exact same impressions uh, when I showed you the first graph from our present day or modern point of view. And what does that mean? It means that our 11th century scholar would have a lot of empathy with us in terms of uncertainty, crisis, and urgency. We are all witnessing something unprecedented unfolding right in front of our eyes. Uh, we see a trend that has exceeded historic high and is still going up without any precedence of dropping from such a high level. And uh, that period, as I highlighted in green uh, on the slide, coincides with the Northern Song Dynasty in China. Many China scholars regard the Song Dynasty as China's golden age and the beginning of modernity in Chinese history. It was an age of rapid population growth. Um, in this period, the population of the Chinese empire reached over 100 million, and that population figure is equivalent to the combined population of the rest of Asia and Europe. It was also an age of many revolutionary breakthroughs in science, in technology, in industry, in agriculture, and also in finance. Uh, for example, this is the first paper money in world history. Uh, it was invented by private banks in Sichuan in southwest China to facilitate long-distance trades. With this paper money, 
merchants didn't have to carry heavy copper coins with them when they traveled long distance uh, for business. It was convenient and definitely a major invention in the history of finance. The emergence of paper money also shows how prosperous the commerce was in China at the time and also how expansive the trade network was in the Song Dynasty. Scholars also call the Song Dynasty China's uh, early industrial revolution and it's an industrial revolution not powered by steam engines or electricity, but instead by uh, wood and coal. Iron production in this period was extremely high, as uh, iron was widely used to make weapons, uh, to make armors, uh, to make tools, and to build architecture. Um, in the late 11th century, iron production in China exceeded 125 tons, and to put this number in perspective, um, iron production in all countries in West Europe, adding together, did not reach such a high level until the late 17th century. And the photo here shows an iron pagoda in Shandong province, um, constructed in the early 12th century. It is a rare extant example of how iron was used in the Song Dynasty. From material culture, we can see some snapshots of life in that golden period. This is a long scroll painting that measures over 16 feet long. Uh, it's called the Qingming Shanghe Tu, or simply the Qingming Scroll. Uh, this amazing scroll shows an idealized Song Dynasty city with vibrant commerce and no poverty. Um, I know it is impossible to see any details like that. So, yeah. So let us zoom in to this part in the middle of the scroll. Um, so uh, that's the section in the middle of the scroll. And uh, let's look at how crowded the streets are. Just like the streets uh, in New York or the streets in Beijing before COVID. And uh, look at uh, the bridge. Uh, the style is called a rainbow bridge or a flying bridge. It was an architectural wonder. Uh, the, the design of the bridge used no pillars like the modern bridges, but relied on a series of interwoven locks to make an arc wide enough and also steady enough to cross the river. And uh, at the two ends of the bridge, and also alongside the streets, which I cannot give you a full view, uh, there are so many street stands. They were selling food and other small commodities. And down there in the bottom right, these are inns and restaurants where people can grab a bite or buy a drink. Um, I don't really have time to elaborate or show other sections of the scroll, but I just want to use this as a lens to envision the Song Dynasty, a period of tremendous population growth, uh, consumption growth, and production growth. However, it is not fair to only show you the good side. When there is a light, there is always a shadow. For the Song Dynasty, there actually was a dark side uh, of its impressive growth and prosperity. And uh, it was not really me saying that, but some Song Dynasty people themselves already noticed that shadow side of the Golden Age. Uh, this is a photo of Yan Dang Shan or Yan Dang Mountain. Uh, it is a gorgeous mountain in Wenzhou in Southeast China. Uh, it is a very popular tourist site today, but very curiously, before the 11th century, very few people actually knew about the mountain. And uh, why was that? A Song Dynasty scientist, Shen Kuo, who was also a prominent official and a literary scholar, he offered an answer, and his answer was deforestation. Uh, Shen Kuo explained that uh, Yandang Mountain was not as tall as mountains nearby. And when nearby mountains were still densely wooded, it remained hidden from sight. However, when other mountains became treeless, Yandang Mountain finally emerged into view. And very specifically, Shen Kuo connected such a massive scale of deforestation to a single construction project the building of the Yuqing Temple in the early 11th century, uh, as described in the quote on the slide. 
Um, this massive construction project took place thousands of miles away from the Yandang Mountain in Kaifeng, the royal capital of the Song Dynasty and also the focus of my talk. This massive temple had nearly 3,000 palaces and occupied an area as large as the entire Vatican City. I estimate that uh, this project probably required approximately 10 million locks, which were all transported from mountains in South China and Northwest China. And thousands of miles separated Kaifeng, which I marked in red uh, in the center of the map, and uh, these mountains, which uh, are the green patches um, on the map. These are the most heavily locked mountain. And let's consider the difficulty of long distance transportation at that time between these mountains and Kaifeng. It is not really hard to imagine that the actual number of timber consumption could only be much higher because the loss and damage rate of timber during long distance transportation was really high. And uh, it was amazing that 1,000 years ago, Shen Kuo already noticed the largest scale deforestation and realized that was the shadow side behind Kaifeng's prosperity. Um, he told us that the lifestyle of people in one city could have so profoundly affected the environment uh, um, thousands of miles away. And this influential megacity Kaifeng served as the capital of Chinese empire on and off for nearly three centuries in the medieval period. But not many people in the West have heard about it. Uh, in fact, when it comes to Chinese capitals, I bet most people think of Beijing, uh, which is the current capital of the PRC. And uh, maybe people who have uh, traveled to China and saw the Terracotta Army know about the Xi'an, which was also known as Chang'an historically. But very few have heard of Kaifeng, which was actually the link between Chang'an and Beijing in the succession of royal capitals in China, both geographically and chronologically. At its heyday, Kaifeng was home to 1.5 million people, and uh, that figure was much bigger than contemporary cities around the world. Uh, this slide shows the comparison of the populations of Kaifeng and other well-known large cities in the medieval world. We can see that Kaifeng was undoubtedly the largest in population. And uh, these 1.5 million people lived in a walled city, uh, like the city plans uh, shows here. It was enclosed by two city walls, the inner wall and the outer wall. The area enclosed by the outer wall was roughly equivalent to the area of modern Manhattan. And coincidentally, Kaifeng's population was also about the same as that of Manhattan. Uh, before COVID, Manhattan had a population of uh, about 1.6 million. And uh, that's why I always tell people Kaifeng was the medieval Manhattan. Similar population, similar area, and also similar in terms of wealth and the prosperity. And I hope such comparison can help modern readers to imagine such a medieval metropolis. The keystone of Kaifeng's prosperity uh, was the blue lines on this city plan. And these blue lines symbolize the four canals that ran through Kaifeng. And these clients were the bloodlines of the city as they connected Kaifeng with the rest of the world. In addition to these canals, many other routes, whether man-made or natural, also connected Kaifeng with the rest of the world. Uh, if we zoom out, as we can see, um, like all roads led to Rome, in my case, all roads also led to Kaifeng. It was the center of an expansive transportation network of both overland and waterways. The coverage of this network was unprecedented in Chinese history, and so was its transportation capacity. This network not only provided physical connections, but also established profound economic and ecological connections between Kaifeng and the world. Because the city's 1.5 million people, they demanded a tremendous amount of uh, commodities. 
They needed food for their table. They needed timber for their houses. They needed coal for the, for the winter, and they needed silk for clothing. And these commodities came from an expansive drug geography, and also from a diversity of ecosystems. These physical and ecological connections made the rise and the fall of Kaifeng not only about the city itself. It was also a history of both human and non-human actors in the city and in its supply hinterlands in China and beyond. It was also a history of the rivers, the canals, and the highways、uh, leading to Kaifeng, and the people, animal, trees, and the commodities that moved along these routes. So that was a truly transnational history. Uh, because many of Kaifeng's hinterlands were actually located at the fringes of the empire, or even beyond the political borders of the Song Dynasty.、Uh, for example, to its north, here, to its north was the Liao Empire. It was a vast nomadic empire that occupied large areas、uh, of lands in present-day North China, Mongolia, and also,、uh, also Northeast Asia.、Uh, as you can see, the Liao also controlled modern Beijing.、Uh, this empire was founded by a nomadic people called the Khitan,、uh, and in this talk, I'm going to use Khitan and Liao interchangeably. The Khitan people traditionally lived on pastoralism and hunting. Uh, this is a painting、uh, by an early 10th century artist.、Uh, his name is Hu Gui. It shows a group of Kitan people making a stop during a hunting trip.、Uh, and as I just mentioned, hunting was a major part of the Kitan way of life.、Uh, this painting also tells us visually that the Kitan people what they look like. They had very different hairstyle and、uh, clothing as compared with the Han Chinese. They, their hair was、uh, half shaved, you know,、um, and you won't see any Han Chinese people with such a hairstyle. And、uh, to the northwest part、uh, of the Song was a kingdom called Xixia, and this kingdom was founded by the Tanggut people.、Uh, and likewise, I'm going to use Xixia and Tanggut interchangeably in this talk. And the Tanggut people were semi-nomadic and semi-sedentary.、Uh, this is a small section from a large Xixia period tapestry、um, excavated from Karakoto.、Uh, that was the ruins of a Xixia city in Inner Mongolia. It was first excavated by Russian explorers in China in the early 1900s. And、uh, this tapestry, together with many other Tanggut treasures、uh, found in Karakoto. Are now in museums in Saint Petersburg.、Uh, this particular section of the tapestry shows three Tanggut people dancing, and probably performing a Buddhist ritual.、Uh, we can see that the hairstyle and the clothing of the Tanggut people resembled those of the Kitans, but different from the Han Chinese. To better understand the territories of these medieval polities,、uh, let me overlay the historical map with、uh, the modern satellite image, and、uh, that hopefully helps us to visualize the current ecologies of the historical territories once controlled by the Song, the Liao, and the Xixia.、Uh, as you can see from the map, the southeast section of the continent. Or the original Song Dynasty territory is mostly green at the present, but moving north and northwest,、uh, which lie mostly in the past territories of the Liao and Xixia, are largely yellow and、uh, barren. Many sources suggest that the Liao and Xixia actually had many natural woodlands, grasslands, and oases at the time. Um, so there are records,、um, you know, whether it's official history,、uh, governmental documents, or travel logs of the Han Chinese people traveling to the Liao and the Xixia, and also the indigenous sources such as the Kitan and Tanggut poems and songs.、Uh, I'm showing you one example, a poem written by a Kitan official,、uh, Xiao Zongguan. 
So this short excerpt tells us the beautiful scenery of extensive grasslands in the Liao territory. And the visual sources also support these written records. Uh, for example, these are the mural paintings in a Liao imperial mausoleum. Uh, these mural paintings vividly illustrate the trees and the wild animals of the royal hunting grounds in the four seasons. The slide shows some details from the mural. So these are the emperor's hunting sites in the spring and in the fall. They usually hunted ducks and the swans in the spring and large game animals in the fall. So how did these woodlands and grasslands become the, de the deserts as we see today? It had a lot to do with Kaifeng thousands of miles away. People familiar with the Chinese history often think of the Song as a relatively weak dynasty because its political territory was much smaller as compared with the Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty. However, if we look beyond the lens of political history, I find the ecological outreach of the Song Dynasty was actually much bigger than earlier dynasties that claimed larger political territories. And I think that is why we should no longer confine our research and teaching within the political boundaries of modern, uh, of modern nation states. But instead, we should look at history in a more dynamic, fluid, and transnational fashion. And as I said, some important actors or players that affected grassland ecology in the Liao and the Xixia lied thousands of miles away in Kaifeng. Uh, let me show you this quote from a governmental source. It briefly described a corruption case that involved uh, a military official and uh, several palace employees. So these people were charged with embezzlement and uh, corruption. Well, uh, I know corruption is not something unusual any time in the past or in the present. But the interesting part about this corruption case is that what these people embezzled uh, from the palace were not money, were not jewelry, but uh, mutton and lamb. So why did the officials try to steal lamb from the palace kitchen? The palace actually had access to the highest grade sheep uh, imported from the Liao and the Xixia, and the officials all wanted to taste such premium quality lamb. Therefore, they went so far as to bribe the kitchen staff um, who happily took the bribery from those lamb-loving officials and uh, secretly gave them the empress lamb. Let us look at some figures to get an idea of the order of magnitude uh, of lamb consumption in the Song court. Without embezzlement, the palace kitchen usually slaughtered about 40 sheep per day or roughly uh, 15,000 every year. This figure was not small, as uh, it rivals the number of market sheep inventory in Illinois and Indiana combined. But because the palace kitchen also had to give greedy officials uh, the palace great lamb in exchange for bribery, uh, the staffs blatantly inflated the budget of sheep purchase. As a result, the palace kitchen slaughtered 280 sheep per day, and that is more than 100,000 per year. And to put this figure into perspective, it is equivalent to over 120% of the 2019 inventory of market sheep in Wyoming, the fourth largest sheep provider in the U.S. And this case reveals the massive scale of lamb consumption in the Song Court. It was the most consumed meat in the palace, leading the consumption of pork, the second most consumed meat by over 100 foes. It also shows how lamb was popular among the elites. Um, the officials, even though they could not uh, eat the imperial great lamb, they had um, some exclu uh, exclusive access to you know, uh, good quality lamb in Kaifeng. Because lamb was their salary in kind, and uh, altogether, the Song officials received about 500,000 sheep annually from the government as their salary in kind. Other than the elites, commoners in Kaifeng also ate lamb. 
so I'm bringing your attention back to the Qingming scroll uh, that I showed you earlier in the talk. So many people believe this painting shows Kaifeng, uh, but I'd rather say it is an idealized Song city that resembled historical Kaifeng in many ways. The scenes on the scroll may not 100% reflect the exact streets, uh, houses, and the people in Kaifeng, but they do tell us a lot about the urban life, uh, the urban culture, and also the urban environment in the Song Dynasty cities. And uh, this section of the scroll shows a variety of commercial activities. Um, here in the center um, is the largest restaurant in the scroll. Uh, many people believe uh, restaurants first appeared in Paris in the 18th century. But in fact, in the 11th century in China, there were already restaurants of such scale and uh, popularity. Let us zoom a little bit to see this shop closely. So this is a lamb shop. The sign here shows the name of it. Uh, it's called the Sun Yang Dian, or lamb shop of the Sun family. And uh, here is a lamb on the butchering table. And the sign here shows the weight of the whole sheep was 60 jin, which is roughly 80 pounds. Uh, lamb shops and restaurants like that were very popular in Kaifeng. People enjoyed a variety of lamb dishes. Uh, one memoir, for example, uh, listed about 20 different types of popular lamb dishes in Kaifeng's restaurants and uh, food stands. And these lamb dishes include, for example, a roasted lamb, a sliced lamb head, lamb rice, and even lamb wine, and many more. And we can find the recipes of some of these dishes in cookbooks. Uh, for example, one dish called the mountain lamb stew is cooked uh, this way. Uh, as shown in the picture on the slide, the ingredients of the dish were very modest, lamb, scallion, and a spice for flavor. And the only secret ingredient is the pestled almond, which was used to get rid of the smell of lamb that many considered unpleasant. This was not a fancy dish, but a simple food that commoners in Kaifeng could enjoy. And uh, to explain it visually, on the right is what the down dish looks like. Um, I have translated a bunch of recipes uh, for my book, which I hope will be useful for those of you who want to teach uh, cultural history or food history, or you know, even those of you who simply want to try some medieval recipes in your modern kitchen. So overall, people in Kaifeng consumed from 500,000 to 600,000 sheep every year. And where did this sheep come from? Um, of course, many were domestically raised in the Song, but as I mentioned before, the best ones came from the Liao and the Xixia. Um, as nomadic or semi-nomadic peoples, the Kitans and Tanguts were much more skilled at raising sheep than the Han Chinese. Um, this is a quote by a Song official, Su Song. When he visited the Liao on a diplomatic mission, he saw that the Kitans did not really enclose the sheep, but they just let them freely follow the grasses and the waters. And in this way, sheep multiply abundantly. Susun was truly uh, impressed by the Kitan way of raising sheep. As a result, the Liao sheep were of much higher quality than sheep uh, raised domestically in the Song Dynasty. By weight alone, a sheep raised in China proper at the time weighed around 70 pounds. And in contrast, a sheep raised in the Liao weighed more than 140 pounds, so twice as much. And to get such high quality sheep, the Song government had been constantly importing sheep from the Liao and Xixia. And it was a win-win deal for both sides. On the Song side, purchasing the sheep from the Liao or the Xixia cost only 2% of the price of a live sheep in Kaifeng's meat market. On the Liao side, by selling the sheep to the Song instead of in the Liao's domestic markets, they received four times the profit. 
So both sides were quite incentivized to engage in this transnational sheep trade. Despite such profit, uh, one big problem, as we can imagine, was the cost of transportation. Uh, sheep and other livestock, uh, livestock animals were mostly transported to Kaifeng by land routes. The border markets on the Songliao border or the Songxia border, uh, where the sheep transactions took place, were about 600 to 700 miles away from Kaifeng. Uh, which was roughly the distance from Chicago to New York. So just imagine the difficulty of moving millions of sheep on the roads over such long distance. And in fact, the official records show about half of the sheep died on the way. So such high mortality rate means that to meet Kaifeng people's appetite for lamb, the Kita and Tang nomads had to produce several times the actual demand figure. Uh, I did a rough calculation. Uh, in Xixia, for example, to sustain a constant annual supply for the sheep trade with the Song government alone, they needed to set aside grasslands as large as uh, 40,000 acres uh, or 25,000 football fields. And uh, that was a quarter of their most fertile oasis. And imagine the actual burden on their grasslands if we consider other livestock trades, such as cattle, camel, and horses. And let's also don't forget about non-governmental trades and smuggling. So everything considered to support the Song people's consumption, the actual area of grasslands that the nomads had to set aside was much, much bigger. Overgrazing, among other factors, contributes to soil erosion and desertification. Uh, this is a photo taken in present-day Inner Mongolia. This used to be the territory of the Liao Empire 1,000 years ago. Uh, now, nomads there still graze large flocks of sheep and other livestock animals. But, you know, look at the barren lands as shown in those photos. So the Song period was a watershed in this environmental change. Grasslands uh, have been shrinking and deserts have been expanding in the Mongolian steppe and also the upper section of the Yellow River. Uh, and those are the places that the Liao and the Xixia governed 1,000 years ago. I want to compare the past and the present to bring things into perspective. So let us compare the foodies in Kaifeng well, with the ivoryware collectors in modern Beijing. So when the wealthy ivory collectors acquired more and more ivory products, they probably care very little about the declining elephant population in East Africa. And likewise, when the foodies in Kaifeng ate yummy lamb dishes, or uh, when scholars in Kaifeng wrote beautiful poems about their fancy lamb eating experiences, I doubt most of them realized what they were doing had a real impact on ecologists far away. The case of lamb is just one example of how Kaifeng's tremendous material consumption affected ecosystems in faraway places. Uh, and I hope you remember this timber map I showed in the beginning of the talk. The Song government significantly expanded the capital city's timber geography. For the very first time in Chinese history, the central government in the capital city acquired timber from mountains in South China, uh, such as the ones surrounding the Yandang Mountain, in significant quantities. Such long distance uh, resource acquisition introduced many new wood species to Kaifeng. Uh, and these species were unheard of in North China before the Song Dynasty. But such massive scale exploitation led to noticeable deforestation. So I mentioned that a thousand years ago, um, scholars of the Song Dynasty, such as Shen Kuo, already noticed deforestation. And uh, he also connected it had everything to do with the massive construction of grand palaces and temples in Kaifeng. 
And of course, other than uh, used as construction timber, wood had many other uses, such as for firewood, for shipbuilding, uh, for making wood blocks, ink, uh, paper, and brushes. All of those things were in high demand during the Song Dynasty. Sheng Kuo knew very well that wood was a crucial natural resource for the economy and uh, industry of the Chinese Empire. But he also knew that wood was limited, and he worried about the, the sustainability of woodlands, which were decreasing at a faster pace than ever. And modern research has confirmed Shen Kuo's concern. So this graph uh, shows that during the Northern Song, when Kaifeng was the capital, the total forest area in South China decreased twice as fast as in previous dynasties. And in this period, the Song lost the woodlands as large as the total area of England. What amazed me was that Shen Kuo not only saw the crisis, but he also actively looked for solutions to mitigate such crisis. He looked for alternative energy to replace wood in some industries. And what he found was amazing. He found this greasy liquid in northwest China, uh, which he named the stone oil. This stone oil that he described is actually petroleum. And the stone oil, uh, the way Sheng Kuo named it 1,000 years ago, uh, now becomes the official translation of petroleum in modern Chinese and the Japanese. The places where Sheng Kuo found petroleum actually became major oil fields in modern China. And the photo here shows uh, the Yanchang oil field in Shanxi. Uh, that's where he found petroleum 1,000 years ago. Shen Kuo was very excited when he found petroleum. He wrote that woodlands would deplete one day, but this mysterious stone oil from underground must be unlimited. Um, of course, we now know this is not true based on our modern knowledge, but we are speaking from a vantage point that pre-modern people didn't really have 1,000 years ago. So it is not fair to use our modern knowledge to judge Shen Kuo as incorrect. What I see in him is a responsible citizen who deeply cared about the environment, but without losing sight of the economy. His attention to deforestation and his search for alternative energy was pioneering in his time and is also comparable to responsible environmental scientists and activists today. Many modern Western historians uh, know the coal question proposed by the 19th century English scholar Jevons. Jevons experienced the coal-powered industrial revolution, and he was concerned about the sustainability of coal. And he made a famous prediction of the exponential growth of future coal consumption. Drawing the analogy with Jevons' coal question, I would like to call the concern of Shen Kuo and other like-minded Song scholars the wood question. So Jevons worried the sustainability of coal, which powered the Industrial Revolution. And likewise, Shen Kuo worried about the sustainability of wood, which powered so many revolutionary changes in the Song period, the Commercial Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution, and the Early Industrial Revolution, as I introduced earlier in the talk. All of them heavily relied on wood. So, in summary, the Song Dynasty based in Kaifeng did not have the largest political territory if we compare it with earlier Chinese dynasties, especially the Tang Dynasty and the Han Dynasty. Its political territory was also smaller than its northern nomadic neighbor, the Liao. But the Liao had only two million population, and uh, the majority of these two million people lived in traditional Han Chinese agricultural lands that bordered the Song. There were also not many rivers in the Liao to form a water transportation network like that in the Song. Also, the roads in the Liao were much more primitive than highways in the Song Dynasty. 
So therefore, the Liao's real control over natural resources was actually limited to the small area surrounding its five capitals. The Song, however, with over 100 million population, especially urban population, such as the 1.5 million people in Kaifeng, had massive material demands. And such demands made it necessary to acquire non-local commodities from far away. And uh, the Song Dynasty's expansive transportation network made it possible. As a result, nationwide markets and even transnational markets were formed and thrived. And that was a huge step forward compared to the smaller local markets before the Song period. All these factors contributed to establishing economic and ecological connections between Kaifeng and the many distant places. And um, some of these demands push the ecological boundaries of the Kaifeng-centered Song Dynasty beyond its political boundaries. And uh, I argue the Song Dynasty marked the start of China's large-scale ecological expansion into the rest of the world. I also argue that the Song marked the emergence of environmental modernity in China. What I mean is people in the Song Dynasty 1,000 years ago already developed awareness to environmental changes such as deforestation, and they also connected these changes with human activities. They saw the large human footprint on nature, and they saw the crisis of unsustainability, and they proactively looked for alternative energies. They found petroleum and thought this greasy black liquid could replace wood in some way. Um, as I mentioned from the modern point of view, this may seem like creating a new problem to solve an old problem because now we have really been using fossil energy way too much than we hoped. And we already know that fossil fuels are, not, are also depletable. Um, so now, instead of worrying about wood sustainability 1,000 years ago, we are worried about the sustainability of petroleum. Um, so that's why we are turning to hydraulic, to nuclear, to wind, and to solar energies to replace fossil fuels. Um, I know this year, especially for people living in Texas who experienced really bad winter storms, must be quite ambivalent about alternative energy. Solar energy and wind energy might be solutions to replace fossil fuel, or they may not. But I think the key point is the quest for sustainability had such old roots in Chinese history, and the same quest still goes on. So thank you. I, I cannot see anything. If you can no, read this. Can read oh, yeah, sure. If you can read some of the oh, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, let me first uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting uh, uh, and uh, a very exhaustive talk about the Song Dynasty and uh, and beyond uh, the region of the Sung, uh, you, you brought together many different issues, and I'm sure there are many uh, questions that will come for me. So uh, I guess I can ask my uh, question. I have uh, several questions, but I think the most interesting thing that uh, you, you showed many interesting things, but the initially this sort of uh, uh, these sort of graphs that you show with uh, steep declines after then 1100 and uh, or was it 1200? Uh, 1150 or so. 
and after a 1700, right? Uh, uh, 1650 or so. 12th century and 16th century, so 1100. And 15 something, okay. Um, suggested that you could think of many different possibilities of those declines. I'm not talking so much, which I think you've explained very well, the, the rises. But the decline seemed to, uh, I don't know what they uh, portended or what they suggested. Uh, is it that once the political system comes apart, uh, that it becomes, you know, there's much less consumption and usage, and perhaps particularly of the capitals? And, um, or is it also, does it have to do with the Little Ice Age? Uh, which is, of course, well, people can't seem to decide on what the exact uh, periods are. And so, and I think those would also be instructive of how we can uh, withdraw from so much consumption, right? If we can get some historical uh, information about what happened. Okay, I'll leave it at that, and hopefully you can answer that, and hopefully there will be other questions. Uh, thank you for the questions. So let me actually bring it back to the slides of the decline. Uh, right. So I think, you know, for historians or for any scholars, um, it is not responsible to say that there is a causation we could only, you know, looking for correlations between historical events and the different explanations. And you just mentioned the Little Ice Age. I definitely think that played a role uh, in the drop from the second maximum. Yeah, so uh, that is, um, I definitely think it played a role. But, you know, how much it really affected the drop, it's really hard to quantify. And um, so... Even though it's um, really sad to say, but a lot of those, um, I mean, some reason, you know, one of the reason came from the decline in population. Yeah, so, you know, uh, the Mongol invasion in Eurasia had, you know, led to significant population decline in the Eurasian continent. So that is really sad to say, but, you know, um, that definitely led to less carbon footprint. I, it's hard to draw some direct uh, historical lessons from the past, um, as I show that you know the level now is definitely much much higher than historical levels, and I think it really depends on how we manage our industry and our way of life. Um, you're the expert of sustainability, and you know the. <laughs> and its relation with religion in pre-modern China, I think that can definitely help. But, you know, that's like the, the passive solution, right? We, you know, just try to be harmonious with nature. We try to consume less. That is definitely a way, and I think we should all do that. But um, there also be, you know, we also should do something more active. And I think alternative energy is definitely, you know, the way to go. If I can just ask also about the, uh, you mentioned the Mongol uh, sort of depopulation, but there's also the plague for which we don't have very good uh, information in China, which is really odd because for everything else we have such good information. Do you know anything about the plague and its effects uh, in Eurasia and China? So I think in, in the... Eurasia. I think to me, the most convincing narrative about the plague was that uh, during the Mongol invasion of uh, either Vietnam or somewhere in Southeast Asia, they made contacts with um, some rat species or maybe some mammoths. And uh, that was where um, it originated. And with their conquest to the west of Eurasia, they, you know, spread it to, you know, the, to the rest of the world. And uh, I think most infamously uh, in the siege of a uh, Middle Eastern city, I forgot the name exactly, but, you know, they actually threw the rats, the dead rats into the city. 
So I think that's a convinced narrative. Uh, but I think you're right. There is not much um, narrative about such high, um, you know, highly lethal, lethal, uh, deadly uh, plague in China at the same time. But you know, on the local level, uh, on the local level, there were plagues. Uh, there is uh, one plague that I actually would like to study and make it part of my book, uh, which was uh, the plague that happened during the Mongol siege of Kaifeng uh, in the 1230s, I believe, when the Jing, uh, the Jing dynasty, the Jurchen Jing dynasty made Kaifeng, it's an expedient capital. So it withdrew to Kaifeng with an amazing population. So, you know, people were just packed in the city and uh, something happened. And uh, so from, uh, so I found uh, sources such as, uh, such as some uh, medical treaties that, you know, the doctor described the, um, the symptoms of, you know, people who died in that plague. I think that, you know, probably resembled that of the Black Death, but it was on a local level, it was within Kaifeng, and it happened in a very uh, unusual situation, you know, during the Mongol siege, and uh, people were out of food, out of water, and uh, they were like really packed. So, yeah, so I think in China, you know, there was sporadic evidence of plague uh, breaking out here or there, but um, yes, I happen to found um, a grand narrative of a nationwide plague in China. So we have a few questions. We have a few questions, but perhaps we should uh, uh, alternate. Why don't we alternate. Yeah, okay. Why don't we okay. Go to yeah. Well, let's go for a Zoom. Okay. So first question we have from Nicole Barnes. She writes, "Wonderful talk. Thank you." One aspect of Song People's research for sustainability that interests me is the use of night soil to fertilize crops. Can you speak about that and its impact on Kaifeng? Uh, so thank you for the question. So night soil um, has been a traditional fertilizer in Chinese agriculture. And that was not a new invention during the Song Dynasty. So it has been used before the Song Dynasty, during the Song Dynasty, and also after the Song Dynasty. Um, I think, you know, Mark Elvin, he has this very famous paper, uh, article, the 3,000 years of unsustainable growth in China. So it shows the paradox of 3,000 years and uh, uh, unsustainable. So. And, you know, night soil and other kinds of, maybe today we can see organic fertilizers, they definitely played a role, um, you know, for agriculture in, uh, in, in China. And uh, I don't see that in particular as a Song, Song Dynasty invention. Yeah. Um, so I had a question. Um, thanks very much, first of all, for your talk. That was really fascinating. Um, I had a question about the point that you made about a sense of... Um, oh, I didn't just turn it off. Okay. Um, the, the, the sense of a link between sustainability and people's actions, right? Um, and that's, that I, I took that to, to be... Um, and partly what you were talking about in terms of the recipes, et cetera, the, the lambs grazing, and then, uh, and, and then the recipes that, that showed the kind of habit, eating habits. And so I'm trying to understand a little bit more how it is that you see the evidence of a sense of people's actions not being sustainable. Because it seems like the, the shift is about a sort of drop in population, about, um, but not necessarily, as far as I can understand, about, people, about a sense of what people should be doing. Um, and so I'm sort of curious about this point that you make, because it seems also to be a kind of tipping point today also. You know, there's some kind of sense that we have to be responsible 
On the other hand, the questions are much larger than any one's person, one person's actions, as it were. So I'm just wondering if, there, if you've seen evidence of, I don't know, something like change in diet as well. Um, uh, that, um, that, that, that you might talk about that, that, that provides a kind of counter to this, um, this form of diet that is so sort of heavy on the, um, on the ecology of, 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 the, of the place. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So in the case of lamb, very specifically, uh, I would say that no, I have not really found any evidence of people suggesting that this has this particular uh, effect of desertification in inner Asia, so we should change our diet. But in the wood example, definitely Shen Kuo was saying that there is this wood crisis and we should look for something different, and he found petroleum. Uh, and uh, so I didn't have a chance to talk about this in this talk, but I can quickly show you in the very end, I actually prepared a slide. Uh, another foodstuff, uh, which is a seafood. Yeah, which is a seafood. So that is another foodstuff that, you know, became new in Kaifeng or in North China during the Song period. Um, I am unable to show the entire poem, but in the beginning, you know, the, the, the poet, his name is Ouyang Xiu, a very famous scholar official in the Song Dynasty, he said that this is the first time that this southern delicacy became available in Kaifeng, and people, you know, crowded to the restaurants to taste it. And um, so that's what he wrote in the beginning. And in the very end of this poem, he said that, but did these people, these foodies, did they realize that in order to feed their appetite, the old fishermen in faraway villages, they have to work laboriously on the ocean, on the sea for, hour, for extra hours. So that was his way of seeing the long distance connection between people's diet and, uh, you know, the life way of people, um, you know, in the far away sea, you know, the, the ocean towns. Um, he may not really spoke from an ecological point of view. She was, sorry, he was speaking from a, not even an economic point of view. He was, you know, basically he was saying as, you know, a very responsible scholar official who sympathized with the, the hard labor of the people who didn't really have their voice. But at the same time, uh, you know, in those little towns in South China, they were traditionally very productive regions uh, in terms of agriculture. But in the Song period, I was reading a local gazetteer from a county, uh, you know, in, in the south. So it was, it, it listed a number of sea products that it sent to Kaifeng. And it said that now our fishing revenue can compare with our agriculture revenue. So, which was amazing. So, which means that those fishermen, they probably really didn't mind to work for extra hours on the ocean collecting them. But what kind of uh, ecological effect does it have is yet to be found out. Um, I, what I found, you know, in that specific gazetteer I mentioned is that one of the things they sent to Kaifeng was actually a uh, yangzi, which is a Chinese alligator. So it was considered as edible food. And it was, you know, specifically mentioned as, you know, one of the foodstuff they sent to, to the north. Um, and now we know that it's endangered species, right? But, you know, at that time, people, you know, probably didn't really care about. It was considered as a form of dragon. People may think that, you know, catching it is something uh, very auspicious. It's a good sign. So they didn't really think this from the ecological point of view. It's really us from today's point of view, see what they ate and see what is happening now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, next we have a question from Ying Jia Tan. She asks, uh, she says, I also have a question about the sustainability of mutton eating. What is the environmental impact of mutton consumption in the song? 
did the song alter their mutton consumption habits after the fall of Kaifeng in 1127? Uh, so I mentioned a little bit about the ecological effect of um, the lamb trade of the lamb trade, uh, uh, you know, on the Liao and the Xixia. So what I did was, you know, I was pulling the figure from government uh, documents about, you know, how much sheep were traded. Uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out, but, you know, fortunately I have some figures as my basis to work on. And I need to look at um, some modern figures such as, you know, the fertility rate, the mortality rate, um, the average age to maturity of those sheep and uh, how much grassland was needed to sustain this number of sheep. Um, so that was the estimate that I gave in the talk. Uh, so just to support the governmental trade alone uh, in Xixia, they have to dedicate a quarter of their most fertile oasis in order to sustain just the government part of the trade. And that does not uh, include the trade of other livestock animals, and that do does not include uh, smuggling or, you know, non-governmental trades. So if we add everything together, I cannot provide a concrete figure, but that is definitely something significant. And uh, so he mentioned about the lamb eating habit of, um, um, uh, you know, after the fall of Kaifeng. So this is a great question. Actually, we do have evidence of um, um, about that. So uh, what I mentioned was a memoir about Kaifeng. And uh, there is a chapter or maybe several chapters that listed restaurants that sold lamb dishes and the names of lamb dishes. And uh, there is, an, after the fall of Kaifeng, the Song capital was relocated to Hangzhou in South China. There was a different memoir about Hangzhou and also listed, you know, different dishes in Hangzhou, in the new capital of the Song dynasty. And uh, in that list, we can see that uh, the number of lamb dishes decreased significantly, but, you know, people started to eat more and more uh, food, uh, seafood, fish. Uh, so that's definitely a major change. Uh, when the Song retreated to the south, it didn't really have its traditional access to the Liao and the Xixia, probably on a sporadic level, but definitely not as massive scale as um, it, it had during the Northern Song period. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, oh, Alex and Yang. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this uh, very illuminating talk. Um, I really appreciate the work of sort of exploring the footprint of a city and sort of um, the implications of that for, uh, you know, places far away. Um, so my question is related um, more toward this idea of, I guess, how should I phrase this? So currently environmentalists are really looking at sort of environmental footprint, not just based on population, because they want to get away from the sort of Malthusian uh, discourse um, that really places blame in a sort of a blanket fashion um, and sort of erases the detrimental impacts that, say, people who consume a lot more are having, right? So acknowledging discrepancies in, in damage. Um, and this could be along class lines, for example. So I'm wondering with your historical work, um, looking at Kai Feng, do you plan at all to address um, discrepancies? Um, I, I think you touched on a little bit like, you know, wealthy, perhaps officials um, would, would perhaps consume more mutton or have access to, to meat. Um, and, and be consuming more in general. And so, of course, the footprint is, is going to be much larger. But I, I guess what I would caution against is uh, simply describing Kaifeng as a city of 1.5 million, therefore it has this huge footprint. Um, it might be nice to kind of look at... There's another talk at 3.30. Yes, so okay, look at, look at that. So, yeah, thank you. And there's another talk in a few minutes. So, which, uh, do we have too many more questions? Many more? Yeah, so we'll have to... Uh, 
Why don't you also ask a question and then respond? Uh, sure, I, I will quickly respond to your question. That's a great point. And Kaifeng was actually a highly stratified city. So the elite consumption and the commoners' consumption were very different. So for example, uh, so I gave the example of lamb. What kind of meat could the commoners consume? So those who could consume lamb were people still have you know, some extra money to spend on restaurants. But you know, for most people, they probably didn't even have meat in their plates. And uh, for meat consumption, uh, most of them consu uh, consumed uh, chicken. And the next is pork. So they had a very different diet than the elites. And it was, um, I know to say that, you know, um, we should not think about the 1.5 million people in Kaifeng uniformly consumed this much and that. But we should really look at, you know, this handful of elite people that their need for lamb and for seafood really drove those long distance trays and those far reaching uh, ecological footprint. If they were satisfied with a simple local food and if, were, if, were, if they were just consuming, you know, if they were happy with a domestic raised lamb of you know, less premium quality and if they were happy to just eat uh, chicken and uh, pork, you know, it would not have been such an expansive, you know, uh, ecological story. But you're totally right that, you know, it's a highly stratified city. The handful of uh, elite on the top, they were the ones that really made uh, a difference in this story. Yeah.